What's going on, family? I'm Scrapper Fox, and Museum of the Forgotten Fisticuffs series. I want to continue examining 100 years of world championship fights. Now, Joe Lewis had became the second black heavyweight champion in boxing history when he knocked out James Broderick in Comiskey Park, 1937. And we're going to get to that fight. But I wanted to go through a fight that took place after that fight. Like I told you, 1938 was a great year for black fighters. Because Joe Lewis will give Max Melling a return go. And that was the biggest event during that time, and in my estimation, in heavyweight history. On Monday, August 22nd, 1938, 20 year old. Five foot nine welterweight from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, who was a member of the Black Murders Row fraternity. His name was Charles Dwayne Burley. He would remove the colored welterweight championship crown from his fraternity brother of Puerto Rico, 24 year old welterweight champion, Herbert Lewis Hardwood, who was known as the Coco Kid. He would sit him down three times to a unanimous decision, and he would win that title. Now, who was Herbert Lewis Hardwood? Well, they called him Coco Kid, or Kid Coco. And he was born May 2nd, 1914, in May West, Puerto Rico. He died December 27th, 1966. He was 52 years of age at the time of his death, and he would reside in New Haven, Connecticut. He stood five foot ten and a half inches, fought from 1929 to 1948, had 249 total bouts. 178 wins, 58 losses, 48 knockouts, and he was stopped seven times. On July 26, 1936, he would TKO young Peter Jackson, New Orleans, in the second round and become the colored welterweight champion of the world. He would defend his crown five times. Holman Williams, Sonny Jones, Izzy Genazzo. He fought Pete Herman, Babalino, Kid Aztecker, Jimmy Leto, and Paulie Walker, young Peter Jackson, and Homan Williams several times. Matter of fact, he fought Homan Williams 14 times, defeating him nine times. Be in the ring with Eddie Booker, who would become the California middleweight champion of the world. Chalky Wright, Georgie Abrams, Luther Slugger White, Detroit's O'Neill Bell, Burt Littell, and Archie Moore. Now, June 11th, 1937, Nat Flatcher, editor of Ring Magazine, would donate a belt to the Coco Kid in his defense of the Color Welterweight Championship crown when he defeated Homan Williams. And the man to your left is Charlie Dwayne Burley. And to your right is Coco Kid. Who was Charlie Dwayne Burley? He was born September 6, 1917, in Bismarck, Pennsylvania. He died October 16, 1992, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Fought from 1936 to 1950. Had a total about career of 83 wins, 12 losses, two draws, one no contest, and 50 knockouts. Burley was one of seven children. He was the second oldest, the only boy with six girls. And he was the descent of his mother being a white Irish woman, his father. Was a black coal miner. And Charlie Burley was offered a shot, 1936, at the Olympic Box Office in Chicago. But like colored middleweight champion, the Harlem Thunderbolt, Harry Smith, he refused to participate in 1928 games because of racial discrimination. Instead, Charlie Burley would accept an invitation to the workers' games in representing his country. These games were canceled through the Spanish Civil War that would take place during that time. Now, Burley had a record of 17 total bouts, 15 wins, two losses, five knockouts as an amateur. He would win the AAU Metropolitan Golden Gloves.
And Charlie Burley would give his only defeat to Ralph Zanelli of Providence, Rhode Island, as an amateur. Zanelli was five foot seven and a half inches. He fought from 1936 to 1952. Fort Sammy ain't got Mike Williams, Sonny Boy West, and Kid Gavilon, Rocky Castellani, Bernard Dukeson out of Louisiana, Sonny Horn, Joe Blackwood, Anton Radick, Johnny Greco, Freddy Archer, Jimmy Doyle, Izzy Genazzo, Fizzy Zivic, Billy Arnold out of Philadelphia. Charlie Borley Fort, Homan Williams, and Archie Moore, Lloyd Marshall, and Ezra Charles fought him twice, as a matter of fact. Georgie Abrams, Jack Chase fought him for the California Light Heavyweight Championship belt. Jimmy Bivens, Burt Littell, Oakland Billy Smith, who was also a California light heavyweight champion. Little Tiger Aaron Weed. Young Gene Buffalo. Between March 3rd, 1938, June 16th, 1938, for Fitzy Zivit. And he would lose to March 3rd, 1938 to Fitzy Zivit. And this would destroy his ranking opportunity. Why? Because Charlie Burley was ranked number four. Fizzy Zivic was ranked number three. Zeferino Garcia was ranked number one. Henry Armstrong was a champion. Well, when Charlie Burley had defeated Coco Kid, he would go down on ranking number three. But Fizzy Zivic would defeat Charlie Burley. So when Henry Armstrong defeated Severino Garcia, Fizzy Zivic went to a number one. We also had a fighter by the name of Ernie Rudrick, who was number four. He would get his shot with Armstrong in 1939. But Henry Armstrong would not fight Charlie Burley. And he robbed Charlie Burley of, of an opportunity when he lost to Fizzy Zivic. Because he would defeat Fizzy Zivic two months later. June 16, 1938. And he would defeat him again in 39. He didn't have any problems with Fizzy Zivic. But it was a con job to keep Charlie Burley from being number one. Fizzy Zivic has 64 losses. Though a very good fighter, very tricky, but he was a very dirty fighter. And we'll go through that in 1940 when he faced Henry Armstrong. Charlie Burley would also face Homan Williams. Fought him seven times. Split a victory, three and three, and one draw. Lloyd Marshall, Nezzy Charles, fought Charles twice. Shorty Hughes. Shorty Hughes had a brother by the name of Big Boy Hughes. And they would have some good fights with Archie Moore. August 14, 1942. Charlie Burley would win the Colored Middleweight Championship belt from Holman Williams. But June 29, 1942, he would lose to Ezra Charles. Charles never got that shot with Holman Williams. You're looking at some great fighters in boxing history. But 1938 was some year. Charlie Burley would take the crown from Coco Kid. He would become the colored welterweight champion of the world. Fascinating. Just fascinating. Charlie Burley would defeat Jimmy Bivens. And that's incredible because Jimmy Bivens was some fighter. He really was. He would go up to the heavyweight division and take on Joe Lewis. But Bivens himself never truly got a shot. Anton Christofoli would freeze him out. I had the pleasure of meeting both Charlie Burley and Jimmy Bivens. Both stand-up individuals. That was some fight between Charlie Burley 
and Jimmy Bivens. Now we talked about 1938. Nathan Charles was from Cincinnati. He called him the Cincinnati Cobra. 1938, he would win the Diamond Gloves Welterweight Championships. Now in his career as an amateur, he would win the Ohio AAU Middleweight Championship. Started out as a featherweight. As far as I know, he was the only featherweight outside of Sam Langford to become a heavyweight champion of the world. Now, Sam Langford was the colored heavyweight champion. He had on record five times. He defended the title. But he was never afforded an opportunity to fight for the World Heavyweight Championship. As did Charles did. He won the Featherweight Championships in the Amateurs. And he won the World Heavyweight Championship belt. Well, actually, the NBA version of the title. 1949, when he defeated Jesse Joe Walcott. Solidified it in 1950, when he faced Joe Lewis in Yankee Stadium. Then he was considered the world heavyweight champion. But as a charge, win the Golden Gloves and Welterweight Championship belt and the Chicago Championships. So you had Ezra Charles winning a championship in 1938 in the Amateurs. You had Charlie Burley winning the Colored Welterweight Championship from Coco Cable in August of 38. He had Lloyd Marshall defeating Johnny Bandit Romero, excuse me, July 21st, 1938, at the Memorial Auditorium in Sacramento, California. Ten rounds. And then Ken Overland, who would become the middleweight championship. September 1st, 1938. Ten rounds. That was an accomplishment by Lloyd Marshall. June 24th, September 2nd. Archie Moore was split a victory with Johnny Bandit Romero. But you had a young man from Harlem who would also accomplish a feat. In 1938, his name was Walker Smith. He would win the Bantamweight Metropolitan AAU Championships when he defeated Ed Cipelli. 1938. Ray Robinson was about 15 years old. And his name was Walker Smith, but he would get a card from a former fighter named Ray Robinson. He had to be 18 years old to compete in the AAU competition. And Ray Robinson would do the remarkable. He would win 1938 Metropolitan AAU Open Class Championship, the Bantamweight Division. 39 won in New York and the city and the Chicago Golden Gloves. 40, he would win the Golden Gloves as well. The Featherweight Division. And then he would win the Golden Gloves in a Lightweight Division. And when he turned professional in 40, he was a lightweight and he moved up to the Welterweight Division. Phenomenal fighter was Ray Robinson, two year span. But all this happened in 1938. And I just wanted to bring out these new young fighters who we will be talking about as this series goes by. We'll get back to Joe Lewis when he took on Max Schmeling, June of 1938. Now, Joe Lewis would take on Max Schmeling June 22nd, 1938. 
And he was under a lot of stress, a lot of pressure. He was called down to the White House by Roosevelt. And he told him, you have to knock out Max Schmeling. You can't just defeat him. You have to literally knock him out. Because the country now got involved. See, Adolf Hitler came from Austria and took office in charge of Germany in 1933. You had the 1932 Olympic Games. The U.S. would bring home five medals two gold and three bronze. Harry Wiley Sr., who would become Ray Robinson's trainer, was a head trainer in those games. He was responsible for bringing home five medals. Harry Wiley Sr. was a black trainer, the first black trainer ever to lead the Olympic Games for the USA. 1936. He had a young man who would win four gold medals in track and field. His name was Jesse Owens. And those games took place in Berlin, Germany. When it's in, it was an insult. Have a black athlete dominate. the German regime in that way. Max Melling was the last and final hope for Germany. 1926, what I'm showing you here, Jack Dempsey couldn't redeem himself when he lost to Gene Tunney in Philadelphia. because he would face Gene Tunney again in 1927. It would be considered the famous long count. Tunney was down, as they say, for 14 seconds. According to Battling Nelson, who had a stopwatch, Jack Dempsey negotiated in his contract that he wanted a man to go to a neutral corner if he was knocked down. Referee Dave Barry, who had close ties to Al Capone. And Jack Dempsey went to the closest corner. He sent Dempsey over to a neutral corner. He claimed bought Tony some time. Dempsey went down. Barry started counting immediately. But Jack Dempsey could not redeem himself for a second opportunity at the title. Jack Johnson would furiate the establishment when he defeated Jim Jeffries. Knocking him out in 15 rounds. That would be the only loss of Jim Jeffries and the only knockout of the Boilermaker Jim Jeffries. And that fight took place Saturday, July 8th, 1910. Here you see it in the Daily Mirror. This is one of the scrapbooks I have of Jack Johnson. Every newspaper article that I can gather is in that book. But Jack Johnson couldn't sustain that. 19... 19- 15, March 27th, as you can see. Jack Johnson and Jess Willard. 
Johnson would be knocked out in 26 rounds. And Willard would be knocked out by Jack Dempsey in 1919. He couldn't defend his title. Couldn't couldn't sustain it. Couldn't win it back. Couldn't take advantage of an opportunity. How was Joe Lewis going to do against Max Mellon? Was the question. On the night of June 22nd, 1938, we'll find out. A famous radio call by Glenn McCarthy. Now, Joe Lewis knocks out Max Melling in one round. He was able to redeem himself. He showed what a champion is made of. Yes, there was a setback. But he would face Jack Sharkey. It would end him in two rounds. But the biggest test came when he had to face... Max Melling, the only man to that point that would lay him on a canvas. 72 straight right hands. Replaced the Brown Bomber. Down and out in the 12th round. But only a true champion. Fight it with integrity. Be able to bounce back. 
as Joe Lewis did with all the pressure, became political. Propaganda was Max Melling and Joe Lewis, the two countries who had a difference between them. They were used as pawns. They both knew it. Joe Lewis and Max Melling, 1938, one of the greatest heavyweight championship fights of all times. Ed Hill, Glenn McCarthy, did a brilliant job of calling that fight. That's my number one greatest radio call in boxing history. Now, I have several meanings for a reason why. I think you can figure that out. Joe Lewis and Max Melling became very good friends. Joe Lewis was down and out. Max Melling came and gave him some money. As a matter of fact, he paid for his funeral. Both men were just caught up between two countries. Joe Lewis wanted nothing more than to gain redemption for his loss to Max Melling. But Max Melling was all business to him. When he came down the arena, Yankee Stadium, they threw banana peels, paper cups, water, soda at him. Joe Lewis was amped up for the occasion. Now let's actually take a look at the fight between Joe Lewis and Max Melling. The night of June 22nd, 1938, New York's Yankee Stadium. Now look at where Lewis's hands are. That's what causes Max Melling hesitation to counter with the right hand. Beautiful jab by Joe Lewis. It's right in the kidneys. That's because Max Money has a habit when he's hurt, turning his back on his opponents, grabbing onto the ropes. Beautiful combination by Joe Lewis. Now, Joe Lewis and Max Melling will put on a performance of a lifetime. That's all for this video. I'm Scrapbook Boxing Museum of the Forgotten Fisticuff Series. All great fights and all great fighters will never be forgotten on my channel. Next video, we're going to look at Henry Armstrong and Lou Ambrose in their second fight. Thanks for hanging in there with me. Salute.
Shout out to my brother, Curtis Anderson.